post-movie vlog, I just got out of seeing John Wick 3 Parabellum. Again, this is going to be a low spoilers review. Um, I, as per usual, um, hold off for like about three months-ish before posting spoilers in the comments. That'd be about July. I will also give a specific date in the show notes below. Here's the one overt spoiler I'm going to give up front, because this is a point which I've heard a few people, a few people kind of being a little up, up, nervous about. Nervous, uptight, what have you. I'll go into the movie. Because John's dog is not in a lot of the trailer footage, from particularly footage from, that appears to be from later in the film. John Wick's dog is fine. John Wick's dog, my new dog, the pit bull who he rescued at the end of part one of the first film, survives the movie. They're fine. Other dogs, if you're just worried about animal violence in general, uh, or other animals being hurt in the movie, skip ahead about 30 seconds. All of the dogs in this movie survive. Cats in the movie survive. Um, any animals that we see having harm inflicted upon them are already dead and are like fish getting chopped up and that sort of thing. No animals are depicted as, as being injured in this film. Dogs are being injured or killed in this film. Or at least not killed. Um, no dogs, no cats. Everything is fine. Don't worry about it. If that's something that is going to be that you're legitimately worried about, and seeing the first film, that's understandable. You don't need to worry about that here. So that chunk of spoilers out of the way. Let's get on with the movie itself. The movie picks up more or less right away from the end of chapter three of chapter two. Like if you're doing, like if you were doing a Godfather style. Um, Godfather, the whole epic supercut thing, like they like they used to do back in the day on television, um, or you could get like the big Blu-ray, a uh, Blu-ray with all three movies edited together in one whole. Yeah, this would basically pick up more or less right after the end of the of the third film. There are some as screen saver stuff on anyway. There are stuff. And, like, there's a little bit of passage of time between the end of the first movie and the second. You might say there's a bit of a minor continuity goof. Um, the first movie, or the, the second film does not end at, uh, and ends during the day. When the th third film start, it's at night. It's only been an hour that's passed. So that's a pretty fast sunset, but I'll let it slide. Um... But yeah, at the end of part two, John Wick killed somebody in the Continental. Now, he had reasons for this. Um, the person he killed was a person who, well, put out a contract on him. And, and put out an open contract on him after John Wick had fulfilled a marker for this person, uh, Santino D'Antonio. Dan who had just recently ascended to the high table. The organization, the group of people who runs the Demimond, the underworld of th that, that John Wick, the John Wick world universe runs on. So the, um, Santino had taken refuge in the Continental, and one of the sacred rules of the Continental is you do not kill somebody in the Continental. John Wick broke that rule, and he has to face the, face the consequences. His life is, according to the rules of the society, forfeit. And... So now he's on the run. And the kind of question becomes, what becomes of John Wick? And the answer is, it's complicated. And... Also, that there are consequences not just for John, but for the other people who helped him in the last movie. Uh, the Beggar King, played by Lawrence Fishburne, 
and of course for Winston, the proprietor of the manager, I should say, of the Continental, played by Ian McShane. And the film, well, as with the second movie, it expands on the lore and provides more information while still leaving questions unanswered. Um, glimpses, returning characters, that sort of thing. But there's, there's still more left just on the edges of the frame. It's this great, it's this great sense of world, little trick of world building where you paint more of the picture, but the stuff around the edges of the frame is just incomplete, and it's incomplete in a way that's tantalizing. Um, probably the biggest thing here, as far as for stuff that's explicitly spelled out about the world, is it spells out a thing which I'd suspected, and talked about in internet conversations and so forth about the John Wick universe. And did they, I appreciate that they state this outright. The coins in the John Wick universe, the gold coins, for which are used for transactions, aren't, don't represent monetary value. They represent trust, they represent a trust and favor economy, a social economy. Um, which makes sense. Um, it's a good way of kind of codifying who, not sorry, who owes who what to who, but just, I have a coin which entitles me for a fate, which shows I'm part of the Demimond, and I'm entitled to a favor of some variety within the Demimond. Um, or an act of a certain, and is a, a favor of a certain reasonably set upon value. That coin is, I have access to a location that lets me network, for example, use examples from the first two movies. That coin gives me access to a location that will let me network for other people, other people in the Demimond uh, club, bar, or something like that. Um, I spend this coin to get access to uh, weapons uh, that are not necessarily and cannot be obtained through legal channels, and or and or have been cleaned. They're not in the system, and it's me access gives me access to the, for example, the second film, the ballistic suit that John Wick is wearing, um, or stab resistant clothing and that sort of stuff. The stuff that the assassins wear in doing their job in a way that lets them be discreet without looking like a guy in a tactical vest. Um, that sort of thing. The, it's, and then the film introduced the marker. Uh, this is a bigger favor, and this is, and a marker is not something that's given out lightly. It is an agreement that, it is almost a sacred agreement that you do this service, that I will do a service for you. Presumably in return for you having done a service for me. John Wick had done a un, um had gotten a un, unspecified favor from you know when he doing his impossible task that got him out um prior to the events of the first film um he received a marker from Winston presumably in return for the one hour head start and we learn that he has another marker in this movie that is that it leads to his connection to Halle Berry's character. And Halle Berry's character is interesting. Um, she is clearly sort of an opposite number of Wick, but she's basically a one-scene wonder. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And her fight choreography has her more or less holding her own with um, Keanu. Um, not quite the same degree. Um... I feel like with the way the scene is blocked, we get a lot more, get a lot more stunt work for, uh, like stunt doubles for her fights than say with uh, Keanu. Keanu, I feel like we, we get a lot of fight scene. I mean, there's more than a few bits, which is clearly not Keanu, or there's a room to be for Keanu to be replaced by a stunt double. But Keanu Reeves is a person who clearly likes to show that, not out of 
um, machismo or toxic masculinity, but shows show that he's able to, to do a lot of the stuff that the stuntmen do as well, not because he feels like he has anything to prove, but more out of respect for the stuntmen and their craft, and that he they wouldn't that he's that because they're willing to go the extra mile, he's also willing to go the extra mile. Which is a thing I appreciate about Keanu Reeves, actor, performer, and so on. So, as far as the rest of the movie goes, again, trying to avoid spoilers, um, we get Keanu exploring, or Keanu as John Wick, exploring more into, delving more into the Demimond as he tries to deal with the death mark on his head, the open contract for having uh, violated the rules of the Continental and being declared excommunicado. And this leads to travel to another exotic location. In the second film, we John Wick went to Rome for a hit. For here, he's going to Morocco. That's where we get into the desert bits that show up in the trailer and that sort of thing. And it's all very nice and done. And we kind of meet the... Uh, not to get too much more spoilers than this, but we meet the Capo de Tutti Capi. And it gives a, and from what we meet with him and another member of the high table, we get a better sense of the way the high table works, or not this, not in terms of their rules, but in terms of their in terms of their policies and their how they enact them and the the way they run things. We're also introduced to a like aside from the. Man, the one above the table, and the other member of the high table we meet in Morocco, we meet an adjudicator who is basically the enforcer, so to speak, of the high table. Um, they speak with the high table's voice, and when they speak, and, and they walk with the authority of the high table. They are a proxy, but they are a proxy who presumably has earned a great deal of trust and will not abuse it. Um, so their actions can reasonably be considered to be done. We can represent the intense intent of the members of the high table. And the high table is a whole bunch of jerks. Like, you immediately, yes, you don't become the head of a massive, globe-spanning, organized crime syndicate by being a nice person. But the act, like the actions that they play out here, leads into kind of like it. It's not too much to say that we're probably going to get a John Wick four, and it's clear like this film is John Wick trying to work within the rules to a certain extent get out from under being excommunicado. Whereas in like, by the end of the movie I think his well, not I think, I know that his view of the high table has turned. And that's going, and so that's going to lead to an interesting situation when we get a fourth film, or if we don't get a fourth film, <clears throat> this is expanded on the comics. It'll be interesting to see how it's expanded on there. I mean, the film subtitle is Parabellum, and it's not just as a reference to the, and not just is not as a reference to the type of weapon caliber. It is meant explicitly stated as a reference to the Latin saying. If you, which I'm gonna, I'm not gonna bother trying to pronounce the Latin. I'm just gonna say the English version. If you seek peace, prepare for war. So the Lord's subtitle is just prepare for war. Which, that's, hey, that sounds like a catchphrase for a movie. It's not like a tagline. So if you're making a subtitle, the implication is that the war is coming, but is not here. Film four, or the expansion on the story in comic book form. If we don't get a fourth film. Is going to be the war. Back. No, I'm not going to suspect him, certain. Um, that that war film will be John Wick goes to war against the high table. 
So here's a little more spoilery here to get kind of why I think that. As I mentioned, the film spells out coins, the markers, all represent a trust economy. A trust in favor economy. You do you are by having these things, by being a part of the system, you are saying that you are a part of the demimond and you respect the secrecy of the demimond. You will not expose it necessarily to outsiders. Um and you understand the rules to participate in the demimond. And why those rules, but not just the letter, but also the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And in John Wick Part 2, Santino weaponized the letter of the law in violation of the spirit against John. By giving a marker, you are making an implication that this is a person who you trust. It is a sign of great trust beyond just the coin. It is a sign. It is a sign that you, someone, the person that you have done a great, significant thing for this person, and you will end by saying that you will that this person will do a favor for you, a, a great favor for you at some point in the future. The also implication is that this person is doing this thing by recognizing, by by putting instilling a great deal of trust in this person, and. Santino stabbed John in the back over the mark. Or other and in the sense in John Wick Part 2, Santino wanted to ascend to the high table. To do this, he had to kill his sister, who was going to ascend in his place. He didn't want to kill his sister himself. That would be gauche. So he used the marker to have John kill his sister for him. And then, response to then after John after he forced John out of retirement, cashed in the marker, and John and Santino were square. Santino's response is to immediately turn around and put a massive open contract John in retaliation for John having killed his sister, an action that he forced John to do. In short, Santino, well, everything Santino did is above, is within the bounds of the rules of this, of the Demimond. It is a flagrant violation of the spirit of those rules. As the film spells out, the coins and the markers represent a social, a social contract. And the thing about social contracts, which is something that comes up when you talk about politi politics and the degradation of agreed-upon norms with Trump administration and that sort of thing, is social contracts are not written and indeed have a degree of wiggle room because they're non-written contracts. They are mu There's much more importance to a, in a social contract to the spirit of the rules than just the quote-unquote letter of the rules. So, to put it another way, Santino didn't break the, like, by the time John Wick shot Santino inside the, the uh, Continental in violation of the letter of the rules, Santino had flagrantly violated the spirit of the rules several times over to such a degree that the erratic that if the spirit of if the high if the people on the high table were res respected the spirit of the rules and understood the weight of the spirit of the rules and were willing to rule accordingly on that would have led that while John Wick would not have gotten off scot-free, he would, like, there would be a degree of leniency shown to him in certain respects. But instead, the response from the high table over the course of the film is to crack down hard not just on John, but on the people who help him, on Winston, and on the Beggar King. And that... 
is where we clearly sets up the traje- makes clear the trajectory who hadn't guessed before that these that where this film is going in part three and eventually in the presumably in the upcoming in the presumably upcoming either chapter four or a continuation of the story in the comics. The idea that the high table has lost sight of the spirit of the rules and action must be taken to correct this. And this movie basically sets up to a certain degree if part if part four happens, if chapter four is that story is told in some form or another, who will be going in the new high table? Or the new power players, at least in New York. Angelica Houston's character, who was established as having been a mentor to John in the past, Winston, the Beggar King. Like they are going like they are basically set up now as kind of the anti um high table faction with John Wick acting as their not in, acting indirectly as their sword. They are all to a degree powered by the table and at this point and when they express their loyalty, their expressions of loyalty come not with acceptance or f- like if they do if it does come with forgiveness, it is a it is a for, it is a cruel forgiveness if it is forgiveness at all. So do I recommend seeing this movie? Absolutely. I did not see this film in IMAX, I saw it in conventional theater. And it worked fine there. Um I re- and I and I really liked it. I'm definitely gonna get it on DVD, Blu-ray, whatever when it comes out in that form. And Whenever, the, whatever form the fourth chapter takes, I will definitely appreciate it and enjoy it. Next week we have the regularly scheduled unintended by perspectives. Then after that we have one more, yet one more movie to watch with <laughs> uh, uh, Godzilla: King of the Monsters, the big G. I'll talk about that then in two weeks. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.